Welcome to the Brutal, Bizarre, and Boozy podcast. I'm Declan, the son. And I'm Jane, the mom. Enjoy a drink with us while we tell you some wild stories of the brutal and bizarre variety. Please keep in mind some of our stories might be upsetting to young or sensitive ears. This is the podcast where we talk about brutal crimes, bizarre occurrences, and get you drunk with cocktails themed around one of our stories. To lighten things up, we like to end our time with a chaser. What? um, You're going to do a brutal story this week, right? Yes. Uh, This week I'll be talking about Issei Sagawa. He's a famous Japanese author and pop culture icon who's famous for eating a woman oh that's not very nice yeah not not great no and for anyone listening i would not recommend looking up the photos i i accidentally clicked the photo tab and oh i great greatly mistake it very brutal huh oh yeah fucking nasty okay i'll stay away from it then oh no good Okay, good to know. And what are you going to be talking about this week, Jane? So I am going to be talking about the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California. And the cocktail I will be bringing uh, to share for our little happy hour is the Ward 8 cocktail. Ooh, sounds good. Yes. I think I've heard this cocktail before. I had never heard of it. Um, and in the history, I'll talk a little bit about what, why I chose this drink. So the Ward 8 cocktail consists of two ounces of rye whiskey, half ounce of lemon juice, a half ounce of orange juice, one teaspoon of grenadine, And you shake all the ingredients together in a shaker with ice and strain into a chilled cocktail glass. There is an optional garnish of a maraschino cherry. And the reason I chose this drink was because it originated in Boston, Massachusetts. Part of my story for the Winchester Mystery House has a little detail of Boston So that's why I chose this drink. Uh, Again, it originated in Boston, Massachusetts in the year 1898. Rumor has it the cocktail was created to celebrate a politician, uh, specifically Martin M. LaMancy. He won his election for state legislature and Uh, It was also to honor the city's Ward 8 region that historically supported LaMancy, which allowed him to win his election. So uh, specifically, a key person in my story may have been affected by someone in Boston. And so that is my tie in to the story. Sweet. It's not like you've got some pretty good historical value to it. Yes. Shall we try the Ward 8, which I have never had before? So, and it's a whiskey drink. Did you add the garnish on it, the optional garnish? I did not add the optional garnish because I wasn't going to buy, I wasn't going to buy a maraschino cherry because I don't really like them. Yeah. Right. (laughs) I'm just going to sit in your fridge. Exactly. I don't think they go bad, though. So, you know, we could probably have it again in another five years and they'd be fine. Yeah, but like once you open it, it gets that gummy ring around it and like super glues itself shut. So if you don't pretty quick is you're not getting back in that thing. Yeah, I don't think anybody wants to get back in it anyway. So. (laughs) All right. I'm going to give a sip. That's good. I don't really taste the whiskey in it it's again a little fruity not super sweet with the grenadine i thought it might be a little sweeter because it seemed like a teaspoon of grenadine seemed to like a lot but it's not sweet at all what kind of whiskey did you use because i got some cheap shit in it you can taste it through mine 
Uh, I used a Pendleton Midnight because dad said that's a rye whiskey, but nowhere on the bottle did it say rye whiskey. But dad said my palate's not sophisticated enough, so I wouldn't be able to tell. So, <laughs> which I, think I got something called like old Canadian or some shit. Oh, yeah. Is it yeah, in a plastic nasty. bottle? No, it's in glass. Oh, okay. Well, but it that's was good. on the bottom of the <laughs> the shelf. Well, yeah, bottom shelf is usually on the bottom for a reason. Yeah, I don't drink whiskey too much, so I wasn't trying to get something fancy. Right. Neither do I. So you could always buy whiskey and have it there for dad when we come to visit. Yeah, but he's always switching up his mind. So that's true. That is true. I think he's gone through three favorite whiskeys in the past year. That's a good point. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for my bizarre story? Yes, I'm ready. Hit me with it. Sounds good. There is a -a one-of-a-kind mansion in Central California, although technically I think most people consider that area in Northern California. To me, it's more central, but we'll call it Northern California. It is surrounded by lush green gardens, Both have been toured by millions of people from all over the world. The architecture is beyond compare and a historical landmark. The experiences of people within the massive home have been whispered about for over 100 years. Some people visit the home with excited anticipation about what they might see or experience, while others are terrified by stories that they have heard. Are you daring enough to visit the Winchester Mystery House? I'm I've like, always wanted to go there. Yeah. We were planning on going there and then COVID hit, right? Yeah, basically. Mm. I think you're exactly right. We were planning a trip down there and like the next month, everything got shut down. Yeah. So. All righty. Sarah Winchester was the creator of the Winchester Mystery House, but it's doubtful she ever considered she would be responsible for for creating such a massive home that is full of speculation, rumors, and mystery when she married into the family. Sarah Winchester was Sarah Pardee when she met William Winchester in Connecticut. William and Sarah were married in 1862. William's father, Oliver Winchester, was the founder of Winchester Repeating Arms Company, which was responsible for redesigning a rifle and revolutionizing firearms of the time. The new gun was later touted as, quote, the gun that won the West, unquote. Not being a gun aficionado, I don't know anything about how it changed things, but apparently it was pretty fancy. Well, I mean, everybody's heard of the Winchester rifle. Exactly. Four years after Sarah and William married, Sarah gave birth to their daughter, Annie, Sadly, Annie passed away less than six weeks after she was born due to a rare medical condition. The couple never had any other children, which is really, really sad that yeah. uh, to have that happen. Yeah, and, any weird medical condition for babies is always tough. Yeah. In 1880, Oliver Winchester passed away, leaving his share of the company to his son, William. Tragically, William died three months later from tuberculosis, leaving all of his estate solely to Sarah. At the time, Sarah inherited $20 million and nearly 50% of the rifle company stocks with a daily income of $1,000. That was, yeah, that was the money. money. Yeah. So are you ready for today's money? Yes. In today's money. Sit down if you're not sitting down. In today's money, that is one lump sum of over $580 million and nearly $30,000 per day, every day. 
Dang, we need to start making guns. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> it's so much money. And yeah, I know that's... people say you can't spend that kind of money, but I would try. I, I think I could. I, I would I try could. really hard. I have expensive tastes in cars and houses. I'm trying to like, buy a town or something. And vacations. <laughs> yeah. We could go on vacation anywhere we wanted to go every day. Okay, and we it could would buy never the resort and then just live there for as long as we want. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which would necessarily be a bad thing. Um, so <laughs> after you her... just have more money. Uh, right, because then people are going to pay you to come visit. Yeah. So, oh, the problems that that must cause. Oh, <laughs> boo-hoo. Uh, after her significant losses, Sarah turned to a medium in Boston. Here's my Boston tie. It is believed that the medium told Sarah that her family was cursed and would be haunted by all the souls of people who were killed by Winchester rifles. The solution offered by the medium was for Sarah to move west and build a home for all the souls. And he told her that she would die if construction ever stopped. Damn, she's got the Noah Ark of Demons. Yes. Just come yes. stay with me. And <laughs> the the house became a thing. So... Shortly after this meeting with the medium in 1886, Sarah moved to California in an area now known as San Jose. However, some people believed Sarah just moved west to be closer to family. So I listened to a couple of podcasts, read some stuff on different uh, web pages, and there is some discussion of, well, she went out there because the medium told her. But then there's some discussion like the family actually said, no, she just moved here so that she could be closer to us. So I guess it just depends on what story you want to listen to or believe. Um, she moved a nope. That's the wrong thing. She bought a two story farmhouse with eight rooms and renovation construction began quickly. The house would remain under construction consistently for 36 years until Sarah passed away in 1922. Damn. And it was that's what you do with all your money. You just build right. more house on your house. It literally was under construction every day, essentially all day. Fuck that. Yeah. That's horrible. What happens to a house that is under construction nearly day and night for 36 years? A lot. Sarah started with a normal home on six acres that after 36 years grew to be a home that eventually equaled six acres. Holy shit. Yeah. The original two-story home morphed into a seven-story home. Those eight rooms later amassed to 160 rooms, 13 bathrooms, and six kitchens. Damn near built a hotel. Yeah, essentially. That would be pretty cool to have that as a hotel, but I don't think they ever used it for that. I'm surprised they haven't converted it to that already. I can see the tourism going way up from that. Well, they do they do have tours and they do like special events and stuff. They they used to do special events, but I think it's just mainly tours now and essentially a museum. Mm -mm. Uh, they counted the windows. I do not want to be the person who had to count the windows because those were uh, 10,000 was the number of windows oh in the house. My God. Yes. There are also 2,000 doors, 52 skylights, 17 chimneys, 47 stairways, and fireplaces, three elevators, and two basements. I just thought about those numbers. There's 10,000 windows and only yep. like what 170 rooms you said yeah How many? 100, <laughs> 160 rooms she's just got swiss cheese on the wall with little windows everywhere how do you get that many windows well i mean there's a lot of weird things in this house um i'm going to go into those in a second uh the house was so massive that it takes 20,000 gallons of paint. I hate painting, but if I had to use 20,000 gallons of paint, I would really hate painting. 
Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. The price of this home in 1923 was $5 million, which in today's money would cost $86.6 million. Jesus. Yes. What those statistics don't tell you about is the construction oddities within the home. Like, like you said, there's 10,000 windows. So it's got to just be like Swiss cheese with little windows everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, here's some weird things about it. So there are staircases that end at a ceiling or a wall. So you're just climbing a staircase and it goes nowhere because it goes into the ceiling. That's weird. Annoying. Yeah. Uh, there are doors that open into a wall instead of a room. There are trap doors. I hope they labeled those on the tours and you're not just going to like <laughs> be standing there and then the trap door falls out from under you. Oh, do a booby trap like Scooby-Doo. Right. Yeah. I wonder if Scooby-Doo, if any Scooby-Doo episodes were um, inspired by this house. That would be funny if they were. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are false passageways. Here are some of the windows. There are windows in the middle of the room. So you're in a room and there's just a window in the middle of it. That's weird. Yeah. I don't know why. Uh, random windows that overlook nothing. So again, just a lot of windows. Hmm. Like skylights between the floors. So you're standing on the floor looking down into the room below you. That's kind of cool. Right. I know you love heights. So I'm sure you would be walking <laughs> across those skylights real quick. Yep. Uh, and chimneys that lead to nothing as they're the wrong height and they don't go through the ceiling to the outside. So there's just a chimney, but it has no purpose. Just smoking up the room. Yeah. Well, I hope that nobody is lighting any fires inside of <laughs> that. Uh, some people believe the strange construction was Sarah's way to trick the ghosts but others believe she was just unskilled with architectural decisions that she seemed to be making on her own. So there's a rumor out there that she didn't employ any architects and she was just like, can go to the construction guys and say, can you just build a room like this? And she had no idea what she was asking for because she didn't know <laughs> anything about architecture. And so that's why there's just weird random things. That's so it just... Funny. It just aids to the whole mystery behind yeah. the house because you have no idea what's going on. Um, all these bizarre architectural items certainly aren't scary, but remember, she was building this house with the intent of housing ghosts because the medium told her, build a house for all the souls. Mm -hmm. Since the home... Uh, has been open for public tours in 1923, people have reported ghostly experiences. Some report seeing workers dressed in period clothes, thinking they were hired actors to make the tour more authentic, only to discover that no actors had been hired. Ooh. So, yeah. So some people have said that, you know, they're like in a certain part of the house and they see a guy that's wearing clothes from like the 1900s and he's wheeling like a wheelbarrow and bricks and things around. And they're like, wow, they're doing this tour up really cool to make us feel like we're there at the time. And then they comment on it later to the tour guide. And they're like, no, we don't have anybody that does that. You saw a ghost. Yeah. Good to know. Um, a worker reported hearing footsteps in an area that was off limit to visitors. When he investigated the sound, he discovered he was alone. So he was in a section that they said, you know, no one can be here. And he heard footsteps. So he's following these footsteps, trying to tell the person you're in an you know, area you're not authorized to be in. It's only for employees. And he kept walking around and there was literally no one there. He was all by himself. Ooh, freaky. Right. Again, when you hear footsteps, you don't want to be hearing footsteps that aren't there. No. Uh, people have also reported uh, feeling their clothing getting tugged on, experiencing temporary blindness, thinking that the lights have been turned off. So basically, 
you're walking through and all of a sudden you go blind and you think, oh, everybody just turn the lights off. We're in the room that we're in. And no, you just went blind. Oh, God. And That's it's scary. temporary and it goes away. But yeah, it would be terrifying if it happened to you right then. You're like, nope, I'm out. I'm going home. <laughs> yeah. I, help me find my car and I'll sit there until my sight comes back. <laughs> or call me an Uber right now. Yeah. Uber is not a sponsor, but if Uber would like to sponsor us, go for it. <laughs> uh, people have also heard organs playing and feeling sudden areas of cold. That's free. And that is my story about the Winchester Mystery House. Yeah, I'd love to go check that place out. I would too. I heard I heard another story. And then I was going to include it. It was a ghost story. But the, the story that I heard and the names that were given in the story, I could not find legitimate sources for it. And I was like, I'm not including that because it almost sounded like the person telling the story just made it up for shock factor. Uh. And so I was, I was bummed out that I was like, I can't find... And they specifically said this person's name and the parents were here and this was the parents' names. And I found nothing along those lines, and which was kind of a bummer. So, but that yeah. is my story about the Winchester Mystery House. Super cool. Yeah. I think we should go there someday. I agree. I wish that COVID didn't cancel that one trip. I know. <laughs> All right. So Declan, tell us your brutal story. So my brutal story is Issei Sagawa. And Issei Sagawa was born on June 11th, 1949 in Kobe, Japan to wealthy parents. Sagawa was a preemie and was so small when born that he could fit in the palm of his father's hand. That's tiny. Yeah, little tiny baby. Yeah. From a young age, Sagawa was interested in literature and strangely cannibalism. How young of an age? Do you uh, know? Uh, it's the first grade, first grade in Japan. I'm not sure what that equates, but. Wow. It, it said, yeah, first grade. While he was in class, he was looking at a classmate's thigh and just thought about like taking a bite out of it. Oh, how? Yeah, I don't even know how that kind of thought pops into somebody's head, but okay. <laughs> well, while giving an interview with the magazine Vice in 2011, Sagawa mentioned that in his youth he developed cannibalistic desires for women and took part in bestiality with his dog. <sighs> Poor dog. Ugh. <sighs> Sagawa was studying at Waco University in Tokyo when he decided to target a tall German woman to follow home. He broke into her house with the intentions of killing and eating her, but the woman woke up before he could execute his plan. Uh, she pushed Sagawa down and called the police. Good for her. Yeah. Uh, I Jeez. forgot to mention, Sagawa was a pretty small dude, pretty frail. Still pretty so, small in adulthood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She she overpowered him pretty easily. Uh, he was charged with attempted rape. However, the charges were dropped because Sagawa's father paid a large settlement to the German woman. Sagawa relocated to Paris and enrolled at Sorbonne, Sorbonne to pursue a PhD in literature. While he was studying in Paris, he invited a friend and classmate, Rene Artevelt over to his apartment for dinner and help studying. Rene was 25, blonde, and fairly tall. She so spoke he three. Likes, sorry, huh? he liked tall, blonde women, huh? Yep. Okay, I'm safe because I'm yeah. short and brunette. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, she spoke three languages and was studying for her PhD in French literature. Sagawa asked Rene to read his favorite favorite German poet. After she read the poem, Rene decided to head home for the night. As soon as she left, Sagawa got up, sniffed, and licked the seat that she was sitting in. This is when Sagawa decided he was going to kill and eat Rene. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So he he invited her over for dinner one last time, which she agreed to. He set up a tape recorder to record Rene reciting the poem. While she was speaking, Sagawa went to retrieve the 22 caliber rifle he had loaded before she arrived. In the middle of the poem, he snuck up behind Renee and shot her in the back of the neck. Sagawa stood over Renee as he watched the floor filled with her blood. He was surprised about how much blood was coming out and tried to clean it before eventually giving up. He undressed Renee's dead body and admired his crime before retrieving a knife. He used this knife to cut off Renee's nose and the tip of her left breast. This he then guy. consumed. Yeah. He then Ugh. consumed both of these. Oh he, began... <laughs> he began gnawing and carving away at her body. Sagawa is quoted as saying her flesh melted in his mouth like raw tuna at a sushi restaurant. Yeah, I'm not going to be eating sushi for a little bit after this. Oh, my. Especially oh, after this... looking at the pictures. It's a little... Oh, jeez. Yeah, no, fuck no. Mm -mm. His Uh -uh. knife wasn't doing as well as he had hoped, so he broke out the electric carving knife. (gasps) Yeah, like an old man on Thanksgiving. No, no, Uh no. He cut out one large piece of his flesh and prepared it for a meal. He fried her flesh and ate it with a side of mustard. After finishing his meal, he took photos of her body and proceeded to have sex with her corpse. Of course he did. Of course he did. Because it couldn't get any worse. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, my Christ. Uh, This made Sagawa hungry again, so he cut off her other breast and baked it in the oven. He found he didn't like the texture of this and much preferred eating her thighs. Oh, my God. This guy's a real piece of something. Yep. Uh, He took her panties off and used it as a napkin after he finished eating. When he went to bed that night, he took the remainder of Renee's corpse into his bed and slept with it. In the morning, Sagawa decided to hack her up with a hatchet and shove the parts of her body that he didn't want to keep into a suitcase. By the time he got everything into the suitcase, it was midnight, second day. So she had already been dead for two days before he eventually decided to get rid of the body. Oh, jeez. Yeah. He lugged her body to a local park where he left the suitcase. He was going to leave it in the river. He just left it? Yep, he just left it. He was going to ditch it in the river, and then he saw some people and decided to just leave it. So is there any part of the story where the people found it? Yeah, the people found it and called the cops. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, Don't this open is... a suitcase that you find. Yeah, no shit, especially one that's covered in blood. <sighs> Ugh, good point. And this is where Renee's body was found and the investigation began. No. Meanwhile, Sagawa returned home to eat the flesh from his refrigerator. Two days after the body was discovered, the police arrived at Sagawa's home with a search warrant. Inside, they found Renee's flesh still in the fridge, and Sagawa confessed to what he did. Well, that was nice that he confessed. Yeah, it just came right out and said it. (sighs) Okay. Sagawa was deemed unfit to stand trial and was incarcerated indefinitely at the Paul Girard Asylum. In 1984... Sagawa's father worked out a deal to have him extradited to to Japan. Supervisor of the Japanese asylum deemed him sane, and he was freed 15 months after arriving in Japan. (gasps) What? Oh, 
that is as if the story wasn't effed up enough, but come on. Sagawa was released August 12th, 1986, and has been a free man ever since. He killed, had sex, and ate a woman and only spent five years in jail for it. Holy crap. Now Sagawa enjoys being the focus of tabloids and even wrote a book about his experiences. This book has sold over 200,000 copies. Jeez, oh, Pete, my horrid. Not a fucking cool guy. Oh, my gosh. Okay, Jane, what chaser do you have for us today? So my chaser is that we have someone in Belgium who is downloading and listening to our podcast. And I am super excited about that because I don't know anybody in Belgium. And I think it's fantastic. And it just makes me smile. And I'm like, yes, Belgium. That's so cool. We're international, baby. I know. (laughs) So if you are the Belgium listener, please feel free to reach out to us and say hi. Shout out to you. Yeah. What is your chaser today, Declan? So I have a heartwarming chaser. Love that. So I was looking on YouTube and uh, found this guy who he made a YouTube channel for kids who don't have a father and it's called oh. dad how do i and he just <sighs> teaches like life lessons that dads are supposed to teach like how to shave how to change a tire oh like, that's awesome yeah i just thought that was super cool that is really cool yeah i, I think his story is that uh, he he didn't have a dad when he was growing up and had to learn all this stuff on his own so he's trying to repay it Does- back Does he have kids of his own? I don't know. I haven't looked into his YouTube channel. I just saw it and I was like, oh, that's pretty sweet. That's super cool. What an awesome guy. Yeah. So if you need to learn how to do something basic, go go look at how dad, how do I on YouTube? Awesome. I might have to check that out because, you know, there's stuff I don't know how to do. (laughs) Thank you for listening to our. What is this, six podcast now? I think it is six, yeah. yeah. Uh, we went to Medford today and had a nice little drive. And, of course, there were terrible drivers along the way. And we got stuck behind a motorhome that was towing a truck. That The motorhome sounded like it was going to explode. Every couple of minutes, it was exploding. Thanks for listening and supporting our podcast. We would love for you to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. And if you want to give us a five-star rating, we would forever be grateful. You can contact us at our email via thebrutalandbizarre at gmail.com or on our Instagram at thebrutal underscore bizarre underscore boozy.